you have two groups of people, essentially, who are saying, this is our land. And the Palestinians are talking about occupation, that the Jews are occupying our land. Well, I, I hate to break it to them, but uh, I will. If, if you want to go back, God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people, and he promised it to Abraham and to his posterity through Isaac and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God made it very clear. So he promised, he promised a land, a specific land, to Abraham's descendants through Abraham, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that land is, is a God-given covenant that was made to Israel. And so if you understand that, and you're watching the current conflict, you, you understand that the Jewish people believe through, through the scriptures that they have, that, was, that were given to them by God, and the covenant promise that was given to Abraham, that that is their land. Now you have people who came much later who say, no, 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 you know, we have historic precedent to the land, so we control the land, it's ours, and Israel is occupying our land. So what you have is this, these two, two competing ideologies for this land. And it's not just the Palestinians, it's the entire Arab world. It's the entire Middle East. And, and I made this point last week, and I'm gonna make it again. If you look at a map of, of the Middle East, and you see that all of the nations, by and large, in the entire Middle East are all Islamic nations. They're not all, per se, Arab nations. The Iranians are Persian. The Turks are Turks. The Egyptians are Egyptian. The Saudis are Arabs. But what unites them, in large measure, is Islam, their religious ideology. But they, but they use this religious ideology that they have, and they use specifically the Palestinian people as a wedge issue against Israel. Now, why do millions and millions and millions of, of Muslims in the Arab world and all of these nations in the Middle East, with so much land and so much wealth, why are they so interested in tiny little Israel as a dot in the center of the Middle East, and why are they so interested in supporting the Palestinian people? And I mentioned this to you a week ago. If they were interested in helping the Palestinians to give them a better life, to care for them, to give them better living accommodations, to give them more freedom of movement, they could have done it a long time ago. The reason that, that Gaza is where it is and what it is, the reason that the areas of the West Bank, where a lot of Palestinians live, is what it is, the reason why historically you had other, other areas around Israel and within Israel proper where you had Palestinian people living, the reason that they're still there and the reason that we still have this issue that we're dealing with and that Israel is still dealing with is because the nations that surround Israel are intentionally using the Palestinian people as a wedge issue in terms of the international news media against God's chosen people. This is, this is the issue. And so the issue is, where do you come down on whose land it is? So if you're a biblicist and you're focused on what does the Bible say and what were God's covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then you understand that the land that we're talking about is the land that God gave to Israel as an everlasting inheritance. If you don't understand that, you're going to come down very differently. Now, that does not mean that I don't care and that we shouldn't care about the Palestinian people. All people need the gospel. All people need to be regenerated through saving faith through what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross of Calvary. So it doesn't mean that we don't care about those other people, but what, it, but what we should understand is that this conflict is rooted in whose land it is and who sovereignly gave the land. God sovereignly gave the land to the Jewish people. That is what the Bible says. If you don't like it, argue with God. <laughs> so I want to go back now to the history, to the history of Israel, because when you look at Israel's history, you know, part of the problem we have today is people don't know history. People don't, they're not taught it. They're not taught it in school. They're certainly not taught it in our universities. So people are confused and they don't know what is right from wrong. It was Satan's strategy from all the way from Genesis, as Alan mentioned, at the curse in the garden, that there would be a seed that would come 
and that seed would crush, in an ultimate sense, Satan's head. And so if you were, if you were thinking like Satan is thinking, and that is, okay, then I want to destroy the seed that will come to crush me. Well, where is that seed coming through? Well, that seed is coming through Israel. God raised up Abraham, and through Isaac and Jacob, a nation was, was born. And that nation, all through, is, all through the Old Testament, it is a historical account of God's dealing with his covenant people. Why is the Bible focused on God's covenant people? Because they are the ones through which redemption will come to all of humanity. All of us today, so far removed from those events, should care deeply with every aspect and with every fiber of our being. We should care deeply ab about that account in the Old Testament. Why? Because our redemption comes through that promised seed, Jesus Christ. And so the, the whole entire Old Testament is a historical account of God dealing with his covenant people, the people that he chose to be the vessel through which the promised seed would come. So if you're thinking as Satan would be thinking, he says, well, I don't want that promised seed to come. Therefore, I must destroy the people or the vessel through which that promised seed would be born into the world. And so his focus throughout the entire Old Testament is to use people and nations, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, the Greeks, and then up to the time of Christ, Romans, to use these nations to attack, to either attempt to destroy utterly the Jewish people, or to discredit them in terms of pulling them into false worship system, into a pagan system, or to assimilate them. To assimilate them into cultures that no longer, where they they're not identified anymore ethnically because they intermarry into these other cultures, and where they adopt false religious systems. So that has been Satan's attempt all the way through. And that's the reason that the Old Testament is detailing all of these things. Now, when you, get to, when you get to the New Testament and you open to the book of Matthew, Matthew, this is, Matthew is such a pivotal, crucial book of the Bible. And, and I mentioned this to you before if you've been here, and that is when Matthew opens, what does he start with? Genealogy. If you read through the Bible, and you come to the genealogy, I, I know a lot of people, oh, the genealogy is so hard to read through the genealogy. The genealogy of Jesus Christ is so critically important. Matthew is screaming in his narrative that the promised seed from Genesis 3 is here. He has arrived. He is on the scene. The one, the one that has been promised, the one that would bring kingship to Israel, Israel's greatest king, he is the one, and he is here. And what is Matthew saying? He has the, the royal bloodline, the bloodline of King David and Abraham. He has the power. He has the right. He has the authority. He has the credentials to be Israel's king. And then the whole book of Matthew is, is detailing the work of Jesus, who he is, what he's done, how he was preserved as a child, how, how he ministers, how he has power to raise the dead, to heal the sick, over nature, all of these things, is, Matthew is detailing the life of Jesus Christ to say he is Israel's king. Now, can you be a king over a people that don't exist? Or over a land that is no longer under control of the people that you're coming to be king over? So all of this is crucially important to the whole narrative. So now when you get to, when you get to the New Testament and the book of Matthew, you, had, you have Christ's first coming. So it was Satan's focus to destroy, as we said, the people that were the vessel through which the promised seed would come, to remove them out of the land that God had sovereignly given to them. That's why Israel was taken into captivity so many times back and forth, and then God brought them back to the land. Each time they were taken, God brought them back to the land. He preserved them miraculously through their history. So it was Satan's attempt to destroy, 
to discredit or to assimilate the Jewish people. Now, you get to the first coming of Jesus Christ. And what does Satan try to do at Christ's first coming? Kill him. To kill him. And Joseph is warned in a dream to take Jesus as a youngster to Egypt to protect him and then comes back. So there was an attempt even after Jesus' birth to kill him. And eventually Satan thinks, ah, checkmate, I've put him on the cross. I've put him on the cross. But God in his sovereignty had a final move and he raised him again on the third day. So you think, okay, we're done. No, 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 no. No, Satan's strategy continues after Christ's first coming. So if you're thinking logically, like we had just enunciated to you from Genesis and what Satan's efforts would, uh, were through Israel's history to either destroy them, to discredit them, or to assimilate them, do you think he's just going to give up now? Of course not. So what is Satan doing after the first coming of Jesus Christ? He tries to kill him at his first coming, and he does, in God's sovereign plan for the redemption of humanity, Jesus Christ dies on the cross, but he ra he's raised again on the third day. Now what, ha now what takes place? Who's Satan going to go after? The people that were the vessel who brought the promised seed into the world, the Jewish people. So if you want to understand the persecution, you know, I talk to Jewish people in Israel and other places through the years, and I'll, I'll say, do you understand, does it make sense to you why you've been, your people have been so targeted through human history? And tears come to their eyes, and they, 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 feel like, they feel like the Jewish people are unique to God and they are special to God, but they don't understand the big picture. They scratch their heads and they don't understand why they have been so targeted and so persecuted. You know why? because they don't understand that Jesus, that Yeshua, was the promised seed from Genesis chapter three. They don't understand that their Messiah already came and that he's coming again. So they scratch their heads and don't understand why the persecution, why the history, why the obsession of, the, of their neighbors who live in that whole region and the world to continually persecute them and to try to wipe them off the map. You know, all of that continued after the first coming of Jesus Christ. Persecution continued. You come to the Holocaust. The Holocaust. I have stood with many groups in Israel through the years outside of the Holocaust Memorial in Israel. It's called Yad Vashem. And I always try to take time because I know that when they go into the museum, the emotion runs high because you see the imagery of the persecution of the Jews at the hands of the Nazis. Absolute and utter evil and depravity. Hard to even understand how humans could do that to another human. But I say to the people before they go in, there is victory that came out of this Holocaust. Because it was another satanic attempt to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. Why? Why do you think there was that attempt to do so? Because Satan understands that that same Jesus who came the first time to die for the sin of humanity is coming back the second time as king of Israel and king of kings and lord of lords. And he is coming back, as we said in the book of Matthew, as the legitimate heir to the throne of King David. He has the bloodline. He has the right, the power, the authority, and the credentials to be Israel's king. Satan doesn't want there to be a people group called the Jews living in Israel because he knows that the promised king of Israel and the seed that will crush his head back from Genesis chapter 3 is going to return, and I think very soon, and he's going to return as Israel's legitimate king. Amen. And therefore, Satan does not want a people group called the Jews living in Israel 
Because how do you have a king of Israel coming back to rule and reign to a people that, doesn't, that don't exist and to a land that they don't control? So this is the satanic effort and the victory that came out of the horrors of the Holocaust was that God used what Satan intended to wipe the Jewish people from the earth. He used it as a vehicle to put them back in their ancient homeland, Israel. But do you think he's satisfied now that since 1948, Israel and the Jewish people are back in their ancient homeland? You think he's comfortable with that? No. He continues to do everything he can in his power to use people and nations to destroy the Jews once again. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you will come down on the conflict that you are witnessing on your televisions right now and what will be taking place in the future. You will come down on that based on your understanding or lack thereof of God's plan and program for the Jewish people and that Jesus Christ is returning as their greatest king. You will come down on whose land it is based on the covenant that God gave to the Jewish people for that land as an everlasting inheritance. Did you hear everlasting? It's in the Bible, everlasting inheritance. So when you have people groups saying, well, let's divide up the land and give some to this group of people, and let's divide it up and give some to this group of people, that won't work in God's economy. So this is the issue that, we're, that we are up against. And, and this is the issue that Israel is facing. This is a pivotal moment. Um, you know, if you're, if you're seeing this as a, as a chessboard, the pieces are moving into place very rapidly. And something as significant as what we're seeing taking place in Israel today could really shake up that chessboard and move pieces very quickly into position uh, for the last days um, the emergence of the Antichrist and the end of the age. Obviously, we're watching Iran very carefully. We know Iran is behind a lot of these attacks. They are masterminding it. They are funding it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, they are developing a nuclear weapon, and they have said they will use it. And uh, we'll see what happens, whether this conflict opens up beyond just Gaza. Um, there's already a lot of talk about uh, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon coming across Israel's northern border. That would make it a two-front conflict. Syria is already uh, in the mix as well, so that could make it a three-front conflict. And then you have the area of the West Bank, um, just outside of Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and the Jordan River. That could make it a four-front conflict. And uh, if Iran gets into the mix um, directly, they are they are involved in the mix. But if they get in directly, um, that could really open up things in a in a uh, a horrible uh, set of events, as a turn of events. Um, and then also Turkey is in the mix. Watch Turkey. They have their naval ships. Uh, Turkey has a very, very formidable navy um, in the Mediterranean. And uh, the president of Turkey uh, does not like Israel, uh, is anti-Israel, even though he tries to play nice once in a while for his own political benefits. Uh, he is... Uh, he is anti-Semite. Anti he is uh, focused on Jerusalem and recapturing it for the Ottoman Turkish Empire. He's got naval ships um, that are there too. So there's so many components um, that are at play. So it's important that God's people keep a close eye on these things. Um, watch for any potential peace agreements that may arise. And also be watching beyond that for some type of a reconstructed uh, temple structure uh, in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a big grandiose temple that would take three or four or five years to construct. Uh, it could be something that goes up quickly like a tabernacle structure, um, but the Bible is clear that the sacrificial system of Israel um, will begin once again and that when the Antichrist arises and moves into Israel uh, at the midpoint, he will cause that sacrifice and oblation to cease. Um, and that is in the middle of that final seven-year period of human history. So there's a lot to be watching for. It's important that God's people stay apprised, stay watching, and are praying. And, it, and I want you, and I reiterate it one more time, we can take political sides on things, and we can say we are, we are, uh, our position is rooted in Scripture, and I would concur that that's true. Our position is rooted in Scripture. Um, but we must also care deeply about all of the people that, that are involved, the innocent people that are involved in this conflict, 
Um, yes, there are many Palestinian people who are very sympathetic to Hamas and to their terrorist ways, um, but there are some people who are living in these areas that don't want anything to do with Hamas, just want to live their lives. They need Christ. And Jewish people in Israel need Christ. And that is, that is first and foremost. We can talk about all of the political things. We can talk about who's winning which battles. Um, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And I am chief among them. So we all need Christ and we all should be praying um, that many souls would be saved through these conflicts and uh, through these events and that would turn their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection.